Africa rode the global demand for commodities in the past 20 years to create some of the fastest economic growth figures in the world. At the start of this century, six of the ten fastest growing economies in the world were in Africa. But those good times could now be over. A recent IMF report says demand for commodities has slowed down considerably, representing a formidable shock for many of the sub-Saharan African countries that are still substantial commodity exporters. So just how bad is the situation and how can the continent decrease its dependence on commodity trade? I'm Beatrice Marshall. Welcome to Talk Africa. Now, while the commodity cycle may be turning, its sustainability is anyone's guess. But there's no doubt that it has already negatively impacted several African economies that have not diversified away from these primary resources. While South Africa has many economic issues, mining, economists maintain, continues to contribute to the country's economy, not only at a macroeconomic level, but at local and community levels. According to the latest data, mining contributed 7.6% to the GDP and 15% to foreign direct investment in fixed capital projects. The sector also accounted for 20% of all private investment flows locally. On the jobs front, mining activity created 500,000 jobs. On the downside, the sector has shed 47,000 jobs since 2012, and the Department of Mineral Resources says that at least 32,000 are currently at risk of being lost. We know that many of the big mining players are downscaling and selling off non-profitable shafts and mines, or, as is the case with Anglo-American Platinum, looking for opportunities elsewhere in the value chain. When it comes to exports, mining was responsible for 25% of the value of all exports. While the quantum may vary, many African countries are in similar positions, and governments are re-evaluating their economic policies in a drive to diversify. The South African sector is on a similar drive. It's looking to add value and build a value chain in the country to beneficiate natural resources. The Department of Trade and Industry is exploring a specialist development zone in the platinum belt near Rustenburg, although plans remain a little sketchy. Analysts say that these and other plans need to be implemented so that the sector can stabilize and eventually be ready to take advantage of the next commodity upswing. Lindim Tongana, CCTV. Now, one country that has been heavily dependent on oil is Nigeria. But President Muhammad Buhari has said that his administration will enact new policies to diversify Nigeria's economy to other sectors like agriculture, mining and manufacturing. CCTV Africa's Kelechi Emekalam unpacked that decision as well as its progress. Shops like this one, five of them fully stacked with bags of rice, beans and millet. That's how Ado Umar and his family have kept their business running for over 12 years. But last year, they had to shut down four and are now operating just this one. He complains business has been slow and that the demand for goods has fallen drastically. Business is not moving like before because of rice. Last year, facing that he did buy 20 bags. Now, this year, he back to buying five, six at times, my you go buy for instead to buy that six that they buy. Big. But before, is he is buying twenty. A huge lot of the rice here is imported. Nigeria consumes about three hundred million tons of imported rice, but import volumes are now on a downward spiral. For more than a year, the country's economy has been battered by the effects of falling crude oil prices. Its currency is on a free fall against the U.S. dollar and the economy slipping into a recession. This translates into a rising cost of imports and less disposable income in the economy. In the past decade, Africa recorded one of the world's fastest economic growth figures. Propelled by crude oil exports, Nigeria enjoyed a robust growth rate of 7% until recently when crude oil prices came tumbling down. Its GDP is now projected to grow at 4% and that too could slide even further. 
Nigeria is Africa's biggest crude oil exporter. Oil accounts for about 90% of the country's exports and 70% of its earnings. A slump in crude oil price has denied it nearly 80% of revenue and the country's forex has now shrunk to $27 billion. We've lost close to about 80% of our government budget that used to come from crude oil, from an all-time high of about $100 per barrel to less than 30. We've also lost a good part of the what consists about 90% of our foreign exchange earnings. The Nigerian leader has taken a tough stance on corruption and is emphasizing effective use of government resources. But key in his reform agenda are efforts to diversify the economy, and that means revitalizing the country's agricultural sector and exploring the potential in minerals. Some economists here think diversifying the economy should emphasize primary production alongside industrialization. You can imagine where you are not importing fruit juices and all those mangoes, oranges that you see around Benue State that are wasted are now being, you know, harnessed and packaged locally. If somebody, people are going to do that, so they'll be putting jobs. If the local assembly and manufacturing car plants begin to produce more, they will employ more Nigerians. Meanwhile, President Buhari seems to be pursuing a raft of measures, including rallying OPEC countries to cut crude oil production to stabilize prices. But what's clear is that there are no quick fixes and Nigeria might have to wait a little longer. Kelechia Mekalam, CCTV Abuja, Nigeria. We're going to take a short break now, but when we come back, my expert guests will help analyze the future of Africa and commodities trade. Stay with us. The kind of childhood I had made me live the life that millions of Africans live here in, in the continent. And it also helps me tell the story, not just from an observer's point of view, but from a point of view of somebody who's lived that life and is able to articulate the issues better. UNICEF has reintegrated 2,000. Meanwhile, the United States has threatened the Africa is one of the continents with lots of stories to tell and which in my view haven't yet been told, at least not from the, from the viewpoint of the people in the continent. I'm Penny Nakaribe. I'm an anchor and reporter at CCTV Africa. Welcome back to Talk Africa. Now to help chart the future relationship between Africa and commodities trade, I have expert guests standing by. In Nairobi, Julian Amboko, he's a senior research analyst at Stratlink Global. In Johannesburg, Bridget Taylor, she's the CEO of KAON Capital. And in Lagos, Muda Yusuf, he's the director general of the Lagos Chamber of Commerce. Thank you all for joining in this conversation. Let's start off with you, Muda Yusuf, in Lagos, and to the story of Nigeria at the moment. Now, Nigeria. Africa's largest economy. It depends uh, on oil and gas for about 95% of its export earnings, 35% uh, of its GDP, and three quarters of government revenue. What has been the impact on Nigeria's economy uh, from the falling oil prices? What has been the cost of Nigerians' high reliance on oil? Well, the impact has been very profound, especially on investors. Uh, because of the high reliance on crude oil for foreign exchange earnings, uh, the exchange rate has uh, depreciated significantly, especially in the parallel market. Although in the official market, uh, the CBN is still fixing the exchange rate at 197 naira to the dollar. But generally, the impact has been very profound, uh, particularly with respect to the cost of production. Uh, by manufacturers because quite a lot of them depend on uh, imports, imported raw materials, imported inputs, imported spare parts, and it has been very difficult for many of them to sustain their level of production. Right. Uh, and generally in the economy, the prices have been going up because of the high, high dependence of uh, the economy on imports. So the, the price level has gone up significantly. And many offshore Obligations are difficult to be met now by investors. Uh, 
many investors are finding it difficult to meet their offshore obligations to their suppliers. Quite a number of them have defaulted. Many foreign investors are finding it difficult to remit uh, their funds to their home countries, the airlines and some other foreign investors and so on. And government revenue has also declined drastically. So across all sectors of the economy, the public sector, the private sector, the large enterprises, the small enterprises, the impact has been very, very profound. Quite a profound impact there uh, on Nigeria's uh, economy. Uh, South Africa as well has not been immune to that uh, fall in commodity prices. Bridget, to you there in Johannesburg. What's South Africa's story? Well, South Africa's story has been a little different just because we're not such a significant uh, consumer, or should I say producer of oil. And from the drop in the oil price, we've managed to offset some of the deterioration in the currency, which has meant that our, oil, our gas prices or certainly our petrol prices are a lot lower. Unfortunately, though, the weakness of the currency itself has not helped that RAND uh, petrol price as significantly as it potentially could have. So we've still got inflationary impl implications on the back of that. Julian's debunk it for us, though, uh, the different scenarios from Nigeria to South Africa. But debunk for us what's going on in Africa's commodity sector, particularly in those countries that depend uh, on oil and those countries that depend on two commodities like Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana. What's the scenario? I think it speaks volumes of the kind of challenges that we face in the decade going forward. If you look at it historically, this is not something that is happening for the first time. In, if you take oil as a case in point, in 85, 86, we had a similar tumble in prices. We had the same in nine, between 90 and 1991 and 2008 and 2009. And so we are seeing a recurrence of issues here. And what is happening is that we are seeing elevated fiscal and monetary pressures in economy like, economies like Nigeria and South Africa. If you look at Zambia with their copper reliance, it's a similar story. So I think the, the, the reality on the ground is that we are now seeing a situation in which um, it's an opportune moment for policy makers to begin to rethink reliance on commodities. Well, uh, Bridget, uh, let me just return to you though. Are, are many of Africa's fortunes still really tied to the commodities? What percentage of Africa's exports are still tied to commodities? Well, I think that that's the point. And I mean, we in South Africa have the same issue. We've got a lot of pressure on our mining sector. If you look at commodity price fall has been predominantly as a result of the fall in the gold price um, and the pressure on the mining sector. And from that perspective, you know, despite the fact that we've had a deteriorating currency, we haven't managed to increase exports. One, because there's that global demand has diminished. But that being said, and coming back to the global picture, I think that we're starting to see a change of tact in terms of investment going forward. So a lot of very expensive investment was made previously. Last year it came off about 24% if we look at the oil sector. This year expected another 16% off. So that glut in the production is likely to start to be offset by the consumption that we're seeing coming out of the likes of China, but particularly out of India. So I think that for now, this short-term uh, cost uh, implication on the likes of African countries that have spent money and spent uh, capex in terms of producing oil will start to see revenue in the years ahead. And coming back to um, Julius's comment earlier, just with regards to trying to diversify our opportunities and that's really around you know how do we incentivize agricultural spend how do we incentivize um, other types of revenue generators and not put all of our eggs in one basket when it comes to the commodity glut well uh, in lagos uh, muda yusuf you did paint a rather bleak picture about nigeria's economy and right nigeria's uh, uh, repercussion from the dependence of oil and that whole question of diversification as well because president uh, muhammad buhari did has spoken in the past about the need to diversify nigeria's economy how is it managing though to weather that economic storm from the fall in uh, crude oil prices well <clears throat> there has been a lot of effort now a new emphasis on economic diversification there has been a lot of emphasis now on the need to diversify and look at particularly agricultural sector the solid mineral sector you know and perhaps to some extent the services sector and beyond that, the government is also looking at relying less on oil revenue to fund its uh, obligations. There's a lot of emphasis now on the need to make the tax administration more efficient. Because the tax revenue to GDP in Nigeria is one of the lowest in the world. Uh, altogether, I think it's just about 10%. 
as against 15 or 20 percent that you find in other economies. So there is a lot of uh, emphasis now on uh, improving on the tax administration, efficiency of government, independent revenue, and so on and so forth. So there is a lot of effort uh, to strengthen tax revenue and also to also improve on the diversification of the economy. So the government is now trying to encourage uh, more investment in uh, agriculture in solid minerals. And more importantly, the citizens are also being sensitized to look inwards. Right. Because uh, part of the reasons we have all this is because we are, we are too dependent on imports. So there's a lot of sensitization now to the citizens, to the manufacturers, to industrialists, to look more inwards, to do more backward integration in order to minimize the shock. Of the, of, the, of the collapse of commodity prices. That shock on the, of the collapse of commodity prices that, uh, Julian, you did mention earlier on, of course, that uh, this is not the first time that uh, the continent is witnessing this. It, has it come as quite a big shock, though, for African countries? And how resilient are they exactly? And it has come as a big challenge to many African economies. And I think uh, the, um, the crux of the matter is that it, it, it serves as an indictment to a decade plus of, about, of jobless growth. Uh, I think economies now should work towards edifying domestic consumption, such that even if we have a slump in emerging markets such as India and China, we still have enough consumption capacity domestically to try and prop the economies. So I think going forward, that is one of the areas we need to look at. Are we boosting uh, income levels enough so, such that we have the capacity to drive our own economies and not just rely on exports to, to other markets. In terms of uh, Im imports from um, ad advanced and emerging economies, I think we have a lot to ask about our manufacturing and industrial capacity. Why do we import as much as we do? Why is it more competitive to have products from outside than within? So I think those are kind of the kind of issues we are looking at. Bridget, we are going to be ask asking that question. Why do we import as much as we do? Is industrialization the key? And this is the thing, I mean, we have the same issue in South Africa. We have um, a lot of reliance on our imports, and that really puts a lot of strain on us, especially when you see the likes of uh, the moves that we've seen in the emerging markets with regards to a lot of uh, liquidity being drained out of the system. That has then meant that our exchange rates become a lot weaker, and this results in the costs of having to fund all of that. When, as Julius mentioned earlier, there's, we have arid land, we have people that are unemployed, there's opportunities for us domestically as African uh, countries within a continent that has so many uh, viable options to network better together, to have better trade agreements together, so that we protect our continent and we grow together as an African country within an African continent. Because I think if we look at um, opportunities between one another, there's certain aspects of the various economies that add value to one another. That means that we don't necessarily need to import from Brazil or import from America or the, the European zone, that we can rather import from other African countries and it makes it a more viable option. One, they're closer, and two, they, um, there's that opportunity to do the cross-pollination trade type scenario. Julian, you have talked about the impact of, uh, on, on African economies from uh, other emerging uh, economies like China and India. The economic situation in China, how much of an impact is that having on Africa's economies though? The economic impact from China is, uh, I would say, is considerable, especially on economies such as Zambia and Uganda, which we know have considerable trade ties with China. We're seeing a lot of uh, decline in demand for the goods they import to markets like China. And therefore, especially on the balance of payments and, and trade, um, the, the trade matters, uh, which directly translates now to currency strength, etc., we are seeing a lot of impact from China. And now we are looking at uh, funding for investment projects uh, like roads and rail, etc., we are likely to see uh, a significant impact on the domestic economies. Bridget, your take? Well, I think that the interesting thing, though, is, yes, you're right, China is slowing down, and that has been a concern, and you see the knock-on effects in the market. However, I think one of the upsides to that is we're starting to see a real boom coming out of the Indian economy. Um, certainly, I mean, if you look at them, they've also got over a billion people, and the growth of that economy does pose some form of light in a very, very slow growth scenario globally. It doesn't matter where you look. Right. Uh, Lagos, I want to come to you, Yusuf, though, because... Uh Many are now saying that uh, perhaps that commodity super cycle is coming to an end for Africa. Is that your perception in Lagos? Yes, that is, that is the way we, we perceive the situation. And uh, what we also think the government should do is to improve the capacity of the domestic economy and the domestic enterprises 
to be more competitive. Because one of the biggest challenges we have in Nigeria has to do with the competitiveness of our enterprises, particularly because of the state, the quality of infrastructure. So there is a need for us to improve our competitiveness, to improve the quality of our infrastructure, so that the cost of doing business can be brought down considerably. If we get that done, uh, we have the population, we have a very enterprising population that can take very good advantage of the current situation. So the challenge is also more about competitiveness. It's also about putting in place the right kind of policies to encourage foreign investors to come and invest in infrastructure. Because right now, the government of Nigeria doesn't have the kind of resources that we need to turn around our infrastructure. So it is important to put in place policies that will encourage uh, inflows of foreign investors, particularly in the area of infrastructure. It is also very important for us to get our foreign exchange policy right. Because one of the issues we are facing now is the fact that we have a fixed exchange rate regime. And that has been creating quite a lot of challenges, especially challenge of liquidity in the foreign exchange markets. That has also been discouraging the inflow of investments. And we need invest, foreign investment to be able to build the kind of competitive strength that we need to be able to deal with the current situation. So there are issues of policies to be addressed. There are issues of competitiveness to be addressed in order to be able to deal with the current situation. Right. In terms of issues of policy, though, Bridget, and despite the fact that South Africa's economy is quite diversified, what policy measures, though, is the government putting in place uh, uh, to ensure that uh, the South African economy does not uh, slide uh, further back? We've got a very robust tax system. So our South African Revenue Service really is very robust and is a first class in terms of uh, revenue generation from the tax pool, which really does help. So it means we have resources at, at availability. However, it's about the distribution of that. Um, where there are policies in place in terms of procurement around managing the finances that are available. And the big question on people's lips, and often we are asked from foreign investors, what does the growth projection look like within your economy? And that's really where they see viable option. If there's no opportunity for growth, then why would you want to invest? And how easy is it for me to be able to transact within your economy? Can I get my money in? Can I get my money out? And those are the kinds of questions with, with regards to regulation that really, really need to be addressed in terms of attracting that foreign type flow. But the foreign flow needs to be longer term, not just being able to trade on a daily basis, what we call hot money, but it must be that long term sustainable investment where companies come in and put up bricks and mortar, where they're looking for partnership with government and the private sector within the domestic economy. Julian, are Africa's growth prospects now affected uh, in coming years or have government uh, across Sub-Saharan Africa though put in place measures to ensure that economies do not slide? It depends on which side you're looking at. If you look at an economy like Gabon, we know they've been uh, engaging very aggressive diversification efforts for the last about three years. If you look at an economy like Uganda, we know they had uh, been banking a lot on their oil reserves, about 6.5 billion barrels, but now they're being sent back to the drawing board. So it's a patchy uh, image across the region, depending on the country you're looking at, but we are seeing increasingly uh, governments are taking cognizance of the fact that uh, reliance on commodities can be a bit challenging, especially when a market takes a downturn. Uh, reliance on commodities can be a big challenge. Uh, Muda Yusuf, what has Nigeria though learned from the commodity sh shock there uh, in your country? And uh, what is the future like? What is the prospect for Nigeria in 2016? Well, the prospects are, are not too bad, especially if you have the right kind of monetary policy, fix fiscal policy, tax policy, and foreign exchange policy because the policy environment can do a lot to improve the capacity of the economy to recover. The Nigerian economy has very strong fundamentals inherently. We have a population which is the largest on the continent, over 170 million people. That is, has implications for market size and the capacity to generate uh, domestic consumption and expenditure. We also have uh, very large and diverse natural resources uh, which when put to use, which when properly exploited, could also enhance the capacity of this economy to recover. So the future is, uh, will be a bit challenging, but it's still, it's still bright. What we need to do is to, is to get the policy right to properly 
harness other opportunities in the economy. As you know, the oil sector uh, accounts for just about 13% of the country's GDP. So we have quite a lot of activities going on in other sectors of the economy. In terms of diversification, of course, the economy is well diversified. What we lack is the competitiveness of other sectors, the capacity of other sectors to be able to generate revenue and generate more jobs. That is what we lack. But in terms of the inherent capacity of the economy to recover, of course, the economy has very good fundamentals. As long as we have uh, the, the right kind of policies to allow these, uh, these, these uh, potentials to be realized, I think that is what, especially those of us in the advocacy area, that is what we have been advocating uh, to right. government, to get the policies right so that uh, we can harness all the domestic opportunities and potentials that we have in the Nigerian economy. Quite a lot of uh, policy issues to be uh, talked about there. But a final comment from you all. And first to you, Bridget, though, uh, what is your commodity forecast, though, throughout 2016 uh, for the Southern African region? And, and what do you see as the biggest economic risk for the Southern African region in 2016? I think 2016 is going to still be a tough year. I think that we've got a lot of headwinds, um, not just domestically, but certainly from a global perspective. And largely that's something that is out of our control. And unfortunately, until we start to see that global growth turn around, we are going to face the challenges that all of our guests have spoken about today with regards to having to spend the money on infrastructure upgrades trying to empower that middle class so that we have a bigger tax pool. All of these things take time and unfortunately we're caught right in the middle of a financial crisis where we, as African countries we're trying to put these policies in place. So if we can bite the bullets and get through these times, I'm really optimistic that we have the right, inf you know, the right policies in place and the right infrastructure and the right skills in place to take us forward. Because I think uh, going forward, I think the oil price at these levels is probably unsustainable. And I think that the demand globally is going to continue to pick up. So that's an opportune uh, um, outlook for those that have already invested. And I think that policies, when you're in a situation where there's this oil glut and you're under so much pressure, it forces your economy into other ways of generating income and that's a good thing because in the longer term we do need to diversify our opportunities in terms of generating revenue to grow the domestic economy. Right, Julian, so your commodity forecast throughout 2016 and what do you think is Africa's uh, biggest economic risk going forward? I think the first thing to note is that the global environment is undergoing a very interesting tangent point. We're seeing monetary evolution in the United States. We're seeing a fundamental decoupling in China. And therefore, spillovers will continue to come into the African economy. My biggest, uh, what I would consider the biggest risk right now is fiscal and monetary for the African region because we're seeing a lot of uh, adjustments, especially in markets like Nigeria and South Africa and Kenya. All right, uh, to you all, thank you very much for your contribution. And that's all we have time for this week. But thank you to my guests for their insights. In Nairobi, Julian Samboko, he's a senior research analyst at Stratlink Global. In Johannesburg, Bridget Taylor, she's the CEO of KAON Capital. And in Lagos, Muda Yusuf is the Director General of the Lagos Chamber of Commerce. Remember, you can join the conversation online through Facebook, Twitter and YouTube. And do join us again next week for another edition of Talk Africa. Goodbye.